so thank you everyone for being here today. Uh, can you see my screen already? Yes. Great. So yes, as uh, Marta said, um, I will uh, uh, talk about uh, uh, supplier onboarding, mainly uh, in the context of the Hyperledger product that we have been using to develop this solution, which is currently a productive pilot running here in Switzerland. Um, and uh, right, so the agenda for today is uh, um, first of all, I will start describing the use case. So introducing uh, the, 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 the business problem that we are trying to solve. And then I will explain why we decided to use an SSI approach to try to solve from a technical perspective this particular problem. After that, uh, I will deep dive a little bit uh, into um, what Swisscom is doing with SSI and uh, how we customized our solution for this particular use case. Finally, I will have an overview of the opportunity and challenges that we had uh, during this project using Hyperledger Indy and Hyperledger Arias. So let me start. Mm. Yeah, and then at the end, uh, I will review your question and we can uh, discuss deeply about that, if any. So first of all, the use case is quite uh, straightforward. Um, every time uh, a pharma company would like uh, to start working with a new supplier, they need to run a due diligence uh, related to uh, various risk area that the supplier is dealing with. Uh, but this is true every time a supplier needs to start a, a new business with a pharma company. So this process is very repetitive and uh, um, the supplier needs to go through this process over and over again many times. And uh, um, it's quite time consuming. So this particular use case, the solution that we developed is mostly focusing on a cost reduction uh, goal. Now, the problem related to, to the current uh, um, process is the fact that, uh, um, as I already mentioned, every time a supplier needs to do that, he needs to go through the process. And this is very costly, not just in terms of timing, but also on pharma side in terms of uh, internal effort that they need to spend in order to um, do the due diligence uh, to this particular supplier. Then every pharma company has his own onboarding process, despite they may look quite different in reality, most of them are very similar and the results are kept private. So if me as a supplier, I need to go through the onboarding with Pharma One and I, I, I spend mainly one or two days to fill up a questionnaire and to upload attachment, then it may be that I have to do the same and the same with every pharma I would like to work with. Plus all the increasing regulation are slightly changing time to time this process. And so even myself as a supplier, I can be uh, asked by the pharma company to provide more and more information. So we did a sort of business analysis to try to figure out how to improve uh, this particular process. And we realized that uh, um, despite each pharma company has its own process, the process is very similar. It overlaps almost 80% uh, of, the, of the time. Um, but the question are not standardized. So um, the, the mapping of the question, if I go through uh, an onboarding with a pharma or with another pharma, sometimes is very uh, fragmented. And so uh, we thought, uh, why then don't we try to standardize this particular aspect? Um, why don't we try to have a, a clear mapping of the question that are part of this process? So each pharma would be capable to uh, easily map uh, answer that are already provided to someone else. And uh, uh, that was more or less the idea behind. Uh, from a business perspective, the idea was to try to increase the uh, overlap of this uh, uh, process between all the pharma in the industry. So try to standardize this particular process. And secondly, 
to provide a clear mapping on how the data should be treated in order uh, to avoid the supplier to fill up uh, again again the same form but in a different order. And then finally, the last uh, point that we wanted to tackle from a business perspective is uh, to figure out how we could allow to transfer data, not between the supplier and the pharma, but between pharma to pharma. So this would allow uh, every pharma to reuse the effort that they spend in order to validate a supplier and eventually um, onboard a new supplier with a lightweight process instead of doing the process from scratch every time. So from a supplier perspective, adding those three capability um, at the industry capability within um, a solution, the benefits are quite clear because it simply means that me as a supplier, I don't have to fill up this data over and over again. But there's still one open question. How we can uh, also save time and cost on pharma side? And the answer that uh, we defined is this one that you can read in this slide. We wanted to figure out a way to allow a secure exchange of data and trust between all the actors involved in this process while preserving privacy and authenticity, right? So now to explain you a little bit better what I mean, we can see um, mm -hmm. how this goal can be achieved with a classic uh, software solution. So let's go through uh, this chart uh, together. First of all, as I told you, the process right now is uh, um, quite easy. What is happening is that uh, step number one, the supplier needs to fill up a lot of questionnaire and provide a lot of attachment to the pharma, in this case, pharma one, where he would like to start working with. Then the second step on the pharma side is to evaluate the data run the assessment and figure out the risk ratio associated to this particular supplier. And then finally, the data, the outcome of this assessment may be stored in the data center of Pharma One. And this is actually already happening. Then let's imagine that the supplier would like also to start working with Pharma Two. So he needs again to go through an onboarding process, which I, I said may be very similar. So first of all, what uh, step number four, he would like to ask Pharma2, hey, I would like to be onboarded uh, within, uh, with your company, but I would like to reuse my data. I would like to reuse also the result of the assessment that it has been already done by a similar company like yours. So, what is necessary to do for Pharma2 in this particular case, step number five, is to figure out a way to assess the information that Pharma1 is currently storing in order to uh, get those information and finally review those information. So this is technically possible, of course, but what uh, this type of solution would require is a point-to-point -point integration between the IT infrastructure of Pharma2 and the IT infrastructure of Pharma1. And uh, those point-on-point -point int integration are uh, um, quite uh, uh, challenging from a security perspective. And uh, uh, also one of the main problems that we identified is that they are not very scalable because uh, right now in this particular example, we are just seeing an ecosystem formed by three entities, one supplier and two pharmas. But then imagine when this ecosystem is growing and then you have more and more pharma. This means that you will need a point-to-point -point integration among all the actors. And of course, this is, is technically doable, but from a business perspective, cost perspective, a risk perspective is something very challenging. That's why, we decided to try to tackle this problem and provide a different technical solution through the usage of SSI. So with SSI, how the solution can look like is um, represented in this chart. Let's go through again uh, step by step. 
First of all, step number one, similar to the previous one, supplier needs to fill up the questionnaire to be onboarded by Pharma One. Step number two, the pharma needs to run the due diligence, so they need to run the assessment. And now finally, the first step, which is completely different from before, is the step number three. So now through the solution that we provided uh, within this pharma ecosystem, what is possible to do for the pharma is at the end of the assessment process is to issue a verifiable credential signed by Pharma One that state hey, look, I have been doing this risk assessment for this supplier and the risk ratio that I evaluated based on this particular set of data is from one to five, four, right? So the pharma is really issuing um, um, a, a piece of digital information that is secure in nature because it's based on the uh, SSI uh, verifiable credential uh, cryptographic concept. And then this data is not stored and managed anymore by the pharma. The data itself is transferred back to the supplier. So it's the supplier that now is capable to store this information and eventually will be capable to decide to share this information whenever he would like to with another party. So now let's see what is going to happen whenever the supplier would like to start working with Pharma2. At this point, step number four, the supplier requests to apply with a previous assessment. Step number four. Step number five, Pharma2 receiving this request will broadcast to the supplier a, a precise request asking to assess the information that the supplier is storing in his own solution, in his own IT uh, software solution. And then the supplier, of course, needs to give consent to allow the pharma to access this data. And finally, once the pharma too will receive this data, another very important advantage is that uh, um, is, uh, is enforced by SSI is the fact that pharma too will be capable to validate the content of this data without connecting directly with Pharma One. So Pharma Two will be capable to validate if the data has not been manipulated, if the data has not been revoked by Pharma One, and also if the data is uh, consistent with the information that the supplier provided to Pharma One at the moment of the assessment. So. This is a very um, strong uh, um, benefit because uh, if we think again about uh, the possibility of scaling uh, this ecosystem, adding more and more participants, right now we, will need, we won't need any more a point-to-point -point integration between each actor. What we will need, we will need that each single participant should be capable to integrate just one not with a uh, proprietary solution, but with a standard. In this case, a sensor of any identity standard. And then later we will talk a little bit deeper about this. Meaning you do one single integration and then you can benefit from the fact that uh, as more the ecosystem grow, as, uh, the more you will be capable to uh, talk in a secure way with all the participants of this ecosystem without having a point-to-point -point integration and also relying on the security of the data itself thanks to the format of the verifiable credential which is secure in its nature. Yes, and uh, so what we applied mainly, this is, if you are familiar with SSI, this is the typical uh, issuer holder verifier uh, chart that SSI is, uh, let's say, capable to support in terms of technical capability. And this is the concept that we applied in this use case in order to provide a technical solution that uh, is trying to enforce security, privacy, and authenticity of the information. Now the benefit you can imagine uh, in terms of a business perspective, Pharma2, whenever receive 
um, a verifiable credential from the supplier stating that the supplier has been onboarded and uh, screened by another pharma, they can decide what, what to do with this information. They can decide if they would like uh, to run a lightweight onboarding procedure, for example, or for any specific reason, they want to keep having the full onboarding. So this is still up to the pharma to, to the verifier. But applying this model uh, to this use case, we identify this possibility to reduce cost because now we are not just talking about of transporting data and reusing data, but we are also talking about transporting trust and reusing trust to reduce cost. Right, and this is um, a little bit, a quick overview of the use case. Let me check if there is any uh, question already. So, what if the supply, one question is, what if the supplier doesn't want Pharma 2 knows that is also a supplier for Pharma 1? So, uh, this is a very good question, actually uh, related to antitrust uh, aspect because um, it may be that uh, this uh, full visibility uh, for some particular topic may not be compliant to antitrust requirement. So for this particular project, we didn't implement yet a solution to cover this aspect. Nevertheless, we are looking um, on different solutions for doing that. First of all, one, it's uh, about uh, having uh, a sort of uh, uh, neutral entity, which is also in charge of standardizing the process, being uh, the uh, entity capable to issue the final verifiable credential. So the process won't be anymore based on just two actors. So the issuer issued the credential to the holder, but the Pharma One would need to issue a temporary verifiable credential to this neutral auditor. And then it would be the neutral auditor issuing the final credential to the supplier. So whenever the supplier will then share this verifiable credential with a third party, the third party will not be capable to see which was the origi original issuer, so Pharma One. Anyway, they will be capable to keep having trust in this verifiable credential because they trust the uh, neutral auditor that has been um, displaced from a business perspective into this ecosystem of participant. And this is one solution that we are looking into exactly to cover this uh, antitrust aspect. Um, yeah, now I don't see any other question on this particular part. Uh, no, uh, another question. So I also read this one before moving forward. Verifiable credential is only used for verify the credential, but for Pharma 2, whether this is only one reference for the assess, but could be. Sorry, I'm reading it in my mind and then. So to, for everyone who are watching the webinar and can't see the question, verifiable credential is only used to, for verify the credential, but for Pharma 2, whether this is uh, only one reference for their assessment, but could not be used as an assessment result directly because they may have their own assessment somehow. So is this only reduce the retype effort for the supplier? Exactly, thank you, Marta, for reading in through. In the meantime, I was thinking about the answer. Um, no, so as I was mentioning before, right now the idea would be for Pharma 2, it's up to them to decide how much importance to give to this particular verifiable credential. And the idea behind is that uh, most of the pharma, based on the uh, level of the um, risk ratio that they need to evaluate, they could decide to bring the supplier instead through a full onboarding, just through a lightweight onboarding. So also on pharma side, they will reduce their effort because they may say, okay, this other company 
that I trust did already this evaluation. So I'm not going to redo the whole evaluation on my side. I will just do a partial evaluation because I can trust that uh, some aspect has been already taken care of by the original issuer, so Pharma1. Pharma yeah, and this is the answer right now. Don't see any other question. So I will move forward. This was an introduction about the business, uh, the use case and the why we decided to apply SSI. And now we are uh, entering a little bit more into details related to the technical solution. And we are going to talk more about Hyperledger Aries and Hyperledger Indy. But before doing that, I would like to give you a quick context of uh, what we are doing uh, in Swisscom um, and why uh, we are deeply involved with the Hyperledger. So in Swisscom, we are um, currently uh, offering different services in blockchain space. Mainly, I would say that they are divided in two different layers. One layer is infrastructure layer, so we provide managed and unmanaged infrastructure um, supporting different blockchain protocol. Hyperledger Fabric is one of the most uh, um, protocol that uh, we have a lot of know-how internally. But then, of course, we also support other protocols, such, for example, Hyperledger Indy. And uh, that's why, in this particular case, uh, our know-how on infrastructure for Hyperledger Indy was important. Then later, we will deep dive into it. And then the second layer of the offer of Swisscom is mostly related to building blocks. So on top of this infrastructure service, we provide also typical blockchain capabilities that can be easily consumed through REST API, such as notarization, digital asset. But of course, we also provide SSI capability. And that's why you see the block of uh, the centralized identity and verifiable credential is green because this is the component that we have been using to provide a solution for this particular use case. While in the infrastructure side, <clears throat> the color is yellow, because as I will explain you later, for this particular project, we didn't use our own managed infrastructure, but we did use Sovereign, which is uh, um, public uh, Hyperledger Indie network that is available worldwide. And later I will also talk a little bit more in deeply. But to enter also to finish the uh, context setting, um, in terms of SSI in Swisscom, we provide uh, this product called SSI Gate that is a digital wallet that is capable to provide SSI capability through REST API. So whenever uh, you have a software solution and you want to enable this capability to issue credential, verify credentials, store credential, this tool is done exactly to do that. Now let's have a look on how we customize this tool in order to uh, fulfill the requirement of this particular use case. So in this, in this slide, we see a picture divided in three layers. Those are, if you are familiar with the uh, SSI, those three layers are quite normal, but they represent also our solution is made. First of all, you have the base layer, which is the, 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 the blockchain layer where public information are stored. Uh, currently, we support uh, different protocol. Hyperledger Indy, of course, is one of them. For this particular project, we have been using Sovereign. Later, we will deep dive into it. Secondly, the second layer is uh, uh, what we call cloud layer. So SSI is providing, SSI gate is providing a cloud agent that is capable to uh, manage all the uh, operation related to talking with the ledger, but also to exchange data in peer-to-peer -peer manner with other um, identity wallet. And finally, the third layer is uh, what we call edge layer. So mainly where the, actually the user is going to use the software from. It may be a front end, it may be an integration, um, or it may be even a software that uh, is going to be uh, runned on premise of our customer. But let's deep dive into each single layer. 
And then I would like to tell you the challenge that we faced using those technology in uh, this particular project. So layer number one, as I told you, the blockchain layer, what we call DID layer. Uh, as said, uh, we have been using Sovereign, which is a network based on Hyperledger Indy. Hyperledger Indy for us is uh, quite uh, a key uh, project because uh, um, we believe right now is one of the most complete uh, solution if someone intended to use uh, um, SSI with a ledger underneath. Secondly, we already had a previous experience on using this particular tool. And also because of the generic uh, involvement of Swisscom with Hyperledger, we were already aware on um, how the open source community is interacting um, among the Hyperledger framework. So for us, it was easy to start uh, dealing with uh, uh, other tool, not just Hyperledger Fabric, which was our first topic when we joined Hyperledger. Then, if I may say, uh, the challenge that we faced using Hyperledger Indy for this particular project, a little bit complexity. Uh, despite Hyperledger Indy is, uh, is one of the most complete solution from our perspective, is still uh, um, a little bit complex uh, to, um, let's say, spin up uh, an internal know-how about it. Secondly, we faced more, I would say, a uh, uh, use case related uh, problem, the limitation on the verifiable credential side. So whenever you are planning to issue a verifiable credential um, with Hyperledger Indy, right now there are limitations. So if you are planning to issue a verifiable credential similar to a passport, where you have like uh, 10 or 15 attributes, like first name, last name, date of birth, this can be easily done. But for our particular use case, uh, the, the, the questionnaire, they were about uh, 150, 200 question. And uh, this number of attribute doesn't fit from a technological perspective with the current limitation of uh, the verifiable credential provided on top of Hyperledger Indy. So there we had to come up with a solution that um, we are aiming to uh, propose as a Hyperledger RFC in order to see if the community will like what we did and maybe it could begin a standard. So this particular solution is how to attach to a verifiable credential any type of attachment. So you can attach a JSON file with the question and answer, or you can attach generic attachments such as PDF or whatever. And of course, what we need to achieve is to try to enforce security because we know that verifiable credentials are secure because are natively based on a cryptographic proof. But what about attachment? Then we need a way to link a securely verifiable credential with a snapshot of that particular attachment. And so this is, uh, we explored the different solution for that. And uh, then we implemented the one that we thought would have more sense for this particular case. And uh, as said, um, in the future, we are aiming to propose it as a, a RFC in order to have this part standardized. Finally, another uh, challenge that uh, we are currently facing, uh, um, uh, it's the private key management. So right now, if you remember what I showed you before here, um, I would say that 80% of our solution is the second layer, is the cloud agent. This means that uh, our customer where the data of the supplier is stored, where the private key of the supplier is stored. Right now, this data is stored within our cloud solution. So we could say that technically, we are a custodial uh, software right now. But of course, this is not compliant with many security aspects. Because from a requirement perspective, our customer, they need to make sure that they are capable to manage their own data and especially to manage the private key. So this is where the edge layer, so the third layer is playing a role. But the current problem with Hyperledger Indy 
that you cannot uh, separate the management of the private key from the container of the data itself. So this means that uh, right now we are trying to figure out a solution on uh, how uh, this can be achieved because at enterprise level, um, from a security perspective, when we are talking about uh, uh, PKI infrastructure and all these aspects, usually private key needs to be managed by an HSM, so such as an hardware security module. But right now, uh, based on, the, on how the Hyperledger Indie tools are done, it's very difficult to separate the private key from the uh, data storage. And so uh, we are actually facing this challenge and try to come up with technical solution also for that. But uh, as I told you before, uh, we didn't use uh, di directly Hyperledger Indy because we have been using Sovereign, which is a public network that is not directly managed by us, despite we are a steward. So we run a node to uh, also be part of the consensus of this network, I would say. And um, we, de we decided together with, uh, to, with our customer to use this, uh, this um, network for the productive pilot. First of all, because it's an existing infrastructure with a global scale, but then also because we know that we can easily switch at some point if we believe the sovereign won't be anymore the right solution, we can easily spin up a permissioned network based on Hyperledger Indie or another technology in order to keep the case up and running, no matter the ledger below. And uh, while using Sovereign, the challenge that we faced, we are more from a business perspective. First of all, the onboarding process. So as uh, a Sovereign is managed by, I would say, an, an open source uh, uh, volunteer uh, effort, there are uh, um, business governance rules that are set. So if uh, anyone that would like to be recognized as a valid issuer in this network needs to go through a very quick, but still legal onboarding process. And this may be a small entry barrier to grow the ecosystem. And secondly, another very small entry barrier is that anyway, when you have to send transaction in Sovereign, there is a very small payment involved. But this is also true if someone is planning to do the same, for example, with Ethereum, based on the type of solution that they would like to have. So onboarding process and payment, uh, we see that are creating a little bit an entry barrier to give a generic feedback of our experience. Yes, and this is about the first layer, the DID layer. Then the second layer, it's about exchanging data. So whenever the supplier wants to send the data to Pharma2, or whenever Pharma2 has to issue a credential to the supplier, there is a peer-to-peer -peer exchange of digital information that needs to be done somehow. Very similarly to an email, I have to, if I have to send an email to my colleague, I just send an email. But in this particular case, the peer-to-peer -peer exchange of data is done following different, um, different type of communication stream. Of course, it's still based on TCP IP, so on internet protocol, but the standardization below is slightly different. Um, in fact, uh, in order to implement this particular peer-to-peer -peer communication layer, which is very important, we decided to stick with the Hyperledger ARIES uh, standard that are actually rising thanks to the community effort behind this very interesting project uh, called Hyperledger ARIES. If you are not aware of it, uh, um, what is happening there, mainly uh, it's a community driven effort to try to standardize many of the problems that we are facing in the SSI world. And uh, this particular slide is showing you uh, an RFC, so a request for comment uh, with the number 302, that is exactly about interoperability between wallet provider. 
So if you are planning to implement an SSI wallet, my suggestion would be to try to stick with this particular RFC because it's listing a set of technical requirements that you would have to consider. But if you consider those requirements, then your wallet will be automatically interoperable with every other wallet. So you implement your solution and then uh, um, you will be already interoperable with our wallet, for example. Meaning that if Pharma2 decided to use Swisscom as a wallet, but another company uh, as a supplier, in fact, uh, for this particular project, uh, there was also another SSI wallet provider involved called the Sferity. Um, our two wallets, they can already communicate together. And this is very important because uh, it means that interoperability, as you may already know, it's the basis to allow ecosystem to grow faster and also a little bit to create more competition and uh, to have a more uh, uh, interesting market for the final customer, I would say. So to recap, our second layer is based, of course, there are various type of technology that are proprietary by us, but generically, when we are talking about peer-to-peer -peer data exchange, Hyperledger Arias is the way we implemented it. And then finally, the third layer, and then I'm, I'm almost done, um, is the presentation layer. So when the user, how the user is capable to interact with this model of managing data. The presentation layer for this particular project, um, as I told you, right now we are dealing with the problem of uh, non-custodial custodial approach. So in the next few months, we are going to release a software component that is, can be executed by our customer in their infrastructure in form of a edge wallet. So they will be capable to manage their data on their prem, on their uh, infrastructure without being as managing their data. Uh, but right now it's not like that. So um, how their users are currently capable to interact with our software? Our software is a B2B enterprise grade uh, uh, architecture. So for us, it's very easy to integrate, for example, to federate with the identity provider. In this particular case, we integrated with the Azure Active Directory, meaning that the pharma company employee can log in in our system through their pharma uh, account. So we don't deal with their username and password. Secondly, some of the uh, pharma company involved in this project, uh, they decided to integrate our API in ServiceNow. So the, the, the procurement user that today is uh, dealing with the assessment information, they are keep using the same tool that they were um, used to. Uh, but when they click on some button, some button is also triggering some operation on our side. And then, for example, we issue a credential to the supplier. And then eventually some of the participants that are not willing to integrate the, the solution through REST API, but they would like just to start using it in order to understand the benefit, we also provided a very simple front end. For example, for the supplier, to easily interact with the platform. And this is a very simple screenshot of the front end that uh, we provided. Um, this is a very basic version. I would call it um, MVP 1.0. Uh, but as you can see, um, imagine to be logged in as a Pharma 1. There you can see all the interaction that you had with other participant in terms of issuing credential, or requesting to access credential. And then of course you can navigate through the details of the credential, review the attachment, check the status of the credential, if it's still valid or not. So any operation, any technical operation that can be done through REST API can also be done through this very simple uh, UI. And then finally, this uh, confusing uh, picture, it's uh, representing uh, the, the current solution. As I told you below, we have Sovereign. 
then um, every pharma company can uh, have his own identity provider. Let's imagine that right now, just Pharma One and the supplier are using our solution, while Pharma Two is using another solution. But all these actors, they can integrate, they can talk with each other in a peer-to-peer -peer manner, thanks to Hyperledger Arias. And um, as I told you, the connection is peer-to-peer. -peer. So going back to the topic of point-to-point -point integration, that is a problem to, for scaling the ecosystem. In this particular case, every company, they will need to adopt the technology once. And after that, they will be capable to talk with all the participants involved in the ecosystem. And this, uh, we consider that quite a very nice benefit, especially for this use case. Yeah, and uh, this is it um, from a technical perspective. I hope uh, I was clear. So now I think if there is any question, I would be very happy to um, answer those. Thank you, Luigi. This was really interesting. I, I actually didn't realize how much you've been doing and uh, the information that you provided also about working with uh, Hyperledger Indie, Aries, that's, that's all very interesting. Um, so how are, uh, maybe not directly about your solution, but something that I'm very curious about. Um, how did you find the process of working on our RFCs, so requests for comments and submitting new features to the Hyperledger code base, you know? Swisscom is a big company, many big companies don't really like working with open source and contributing to open source. I'd love to hear uh, your experiences there. Yeah. Yeah, so, well, I, I would say that our team, uh, small team, we are more uh, into this open source approach. And uh, luckily we have some sort of flexibility despite we are under the Swisscom umbrella. Um, for the particular topic of uh, trying to push uh, uh, standard within Hyperledger RES uh, uh, framework, I would say that technically is quite easily, but uh, it's more um, um, because there is so much going on today in the identity space that uh, it takes a lot of time uh, and discussion, uh, technical discussion more than business discussion to really uh, get a consensus on top of technical suggestion. And uh, I would say that this is a little May, I, I feel this is maybe a little bit a challenge because I think that on our side, uh, thanks to this project and other project, we may have uh, a view coming a little bit more from a business perspective. So I would say that this view is quite important, but sometimes uh, because most of the people there is technical, uh, it's a little bit um, difficult to I glide the importance of a uh, small business aspect uh, uh, during those discussion. So my personal feeling that somehow, sometimes people give more attention to technical low level aspect. And that's why I feel a little bit tricky. Mm. Yeah, well, I guess you could say that, especially with building an SSI, we want to our community wants to do it uh, very w the right way from the very beginning because I don't think you know if a supply chain fails because someone made a, an architecture error then it's slightly better than if someone's very secret in healthcare information uh, fails right or gets revealed. Um, in the meantime two questions came in um, and I'll read them to you together and you can decide how to answer. Uh, you said one of the challenges with using Hyperledger Indy was how it deals with private key management. Can you explain uh, the issue in more detail? And also, which features do you wish Hyperledger could offer for your supplier solution, but are not currently available today? I feel like the anonymous attendee is part of the Indy team and wants to improve Indy. <laughs> Cool, ah, that's nice. So uh, first, uh, the first question related to the private key management. Uh, right now, um, as I told you before, the requirement from our customer 
are uh, to store the private key or the secret uh, generating the wallet uh, uh, that we actually generated through the usage of Libindi. And this wallet right now may be in form of a SQLite file or a Postgre file. Um, so Libindi itself right now it's for us is a black box uh, piece of code that is managing uh, uh, how to generate and encrypt this wallet, but also how to manage the wallet itself. So in order to separate the private key management, so to extract the private key and have the private key stored in some sort of um, HSM, today we will need to deep dive into the Libindi source code, which for us uh, would be, a, a, I would say, a big effort because Libindi for some, some aspect uh, it's quite complex, especially from a cryptographical perspective. I know there is a very interesting project uh, uh, which is listed under the Aries RFC, if I'm not wrong, from Mike Lodder, uh, which is one of the lead of Hyperledger Ursa, which is called the LOX, that is trying exactly to decouple the private key management out of Libindi. And uh, we are monitoring that, uh, well, not closely, I would say, because last time I checked uh, it was a few months ago. But uh, uh, the solution that Mike is working on may be exactly what we are looking for to solve this issue. And to add to that, in the meantime, I, I did contact some friends at, uh, in the uh, Aries community and got information that Aries-Ascar is the next generation RE storage and that will be the next implementation of, in the next release of Aries, this will come and will decouple the um, key storage uh, from other storage management. Ah, that's great. Uh, how is it called that you say the Aries? Uh, Aries Askar, A-S-K-A-R. I'll just put it in the chat so that everybody can see. Great. Okay, and then the second question uh, was about uh, what features do you wish your wish list for Hyperledger? So, uh, from uh, from the tool that we currently use, well, first of all, I'm really looking for. Um, right now, we don't use uh, any Hyperledger RES tool. We just implement the RFC on our side in our source code. Uh, because uh, we did, um, I would say, uh, uh, um, a technical evaluation of the current uh, Aries uh, uh, available library, the Python one, and the Go one, and the .NET one. Uh, for cultural reason, we are not so much into .NET. Um, we are really looking forward to see the Go version growing, because this will really help us to abstract uh, part of the work that we are currently uh, developing on our side. Uh, while the, the Python part, uh, which uh, if, I, if I remember correctly, is the one that has been created out of Libindi, I feel it, it has, uh, is still a little bit too much related to Libindi. Uh, so to the layer number one, the DID ledger stuff, which uh, for some reason I have the feeling uh, it creates some sort of limitation. So the more those library are implemented and the easier would be for us as Wiscom, improve our solution, but also for anyone that would like to spin up a similar wallet, uh, SSI wallet, I would say. Great, thank you. Um, the very good answer. Um, okay, well, uh, just to wrap it up, uh, I wanted to let you know that uh, we have two coming webinars. First one will be on October 21st, so next week. Uh, this will be on unsolicited commercial communication, which will be a webinar delivered by Tech Mahindra. Uh, and it's all about telecom uh, use cases and preventing fraud and spamming. Uh, and then in November, 1st of November, uh, we will hear Julie Esser from CEO Ledger uh, talking about how credit unions are using member pass to improve the member experience. 
Uh, this will be an update to various work that they have been doing or Siri Ledger has been doing. Uh, loads of interesting uh, outcomes of their work. So even if you heard uh, Judy talking about uh, global at, at Global Forum, uh, I am pretty sure that this will be um, new content. That's how we discussed it. Hyperledger Global Forum uh, talks and all of the presentations are available online. So if you are not, you don't have enough video calls in your life, you can always watch some more presentations. Um, but seriously, uh, some of them have very good technical content. So it's worth watching to learn more about the projects, about, uh, about different use cases. If uh, you have not yet, please get involved. We love uh, new uh, community members. Um, email us, come to our chat, uh, come to our meetings, all of them are public, and uh, let's stay in touch. So Luigi, again, thank you very much, and uh, I'll see you next time. Thank you, thank you for your time. Thank you, Marta. Bye. Bye, bye-bye.